Welcome to Speak for Yourself, Marcellus Wiley, Emmanuel Acho. My dog. Good. Let's start here. And it's time for our top story, brought to you by Popeye's new eight-piece nugget. Let's get to last night's national championship game. Let's go, dogs! Georgia was <laughs> down by five in the fourth quarter, but they came storming back behind two touchdown passes from Stetson Bennett, the fourth, that's a yacht name, and a pick six to seal it against Alabama. Bulldogs won their first national championship in 41 years. And in the process, Kirby Smart also beat his former boss, Nick Saban. Got to bring in Fox College football analyst, Joe Klatt. Look at this introduction right here. I know, I get to like... <laughs> Straight off the private jet from Indianapolis. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, but let's start with you, Acho. What's your reaction to Georgia knocking off Alabama in the Man, championship game? I got a lot here, fellas. First and foremost, kudos to Georgia. Yes. Um, shout out to Georgia. They came out there and they took it to Alabama. Now, I don't say took it to so colloquially because Alabama was leading 18, 13, 10 minutes left. It was a ball game. But I realized, and Klatt mm-hmm. told me this maybe two weeks ago, What Georgia did and what we witnessed last night was a culmination of three to four years worth of effort. Okay. Georgia and recruiting effort. Kirby Smart building a program effort. What Georgia did wasn't just some fluke, gone with the wind type of uh, catch lightning in a bottle success. Mm. It was years of dedication, trying, swinging, at bats, chopping wood, laying bricks, and we finally saw the house in which they built. So my, my first reaction was, This wasn't just fluky. This was true, like, when coaches always talk about, a Cell, lay a foundation. Yes. Platt, lay a foundation. Acho, lay a foundation. This was the foundation having been laid, having been laid, and now we saw the house built. That's my ultimate reaction. Okay. My secondary thoughts really have a whole lot to do with things that transpired after the clock read zero, and that's really what moved me, and I'll move and speak on that. Mm. Yeah, um, the, the foundation, I think you're exactly right, right? Like, Georgia has been building towards this, and they've had really good teams that they felt like could get over the hump of Alabama and potentially win national championships, and it didn't happen, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever reason, whether it was Tua coming in as a freshman and throwing that ball in overtime. Uh, and, and what happened last night was a culmination because they were the better team. You know, they didn't have to go out there and, and finesse their way to a championship. They were the better team at the line of scrimmage. They were faster. Yeah. They were more physical. Yeah. They were deeper. All of those things. They were such a better roster that they could have Stetson Bennett be their quarterback. Mm. I know that that's a knock, but it's the truth, right? They didn't need a, a, an otherworldly performance from a Trevor Lawrence or a Deshaun Watson in order right. to beat Alabama in a championship game, and that's normally what you need once you get to that point. They were able to do it with a roster that was just better than the Crimson Tide. Having said that, I felt like they were very fortunate that Jamison Williams got injured. And I I feel terrible that he did get injured. He was on his way to a big day. Four catches, I believe 64 yards at the time of the injury. It was still (laughs) early enough in the game where that was Alabama's avenue to potentially succeeding and beating Georgia. And I feel like they may have if he stays in the game because late in the game, Georgia – while they did go down and score, they were doing things totally wrong. They left a minute and five seconds of clock time. When, when Bama got the ball back with like three minutes, 30 seconds, or right yeah. around there and three timeouts, there should have been two minutes left because of the just – ridiculous <laughs> mismanagement of the clock from <laughs> the Georgia. celebration. Well, they were snapping the ball right. with 12 seconds left on the play clock, the entire drive with the ga- game clock going. They were, they were doing these things, and I was thinking to myself, like, you're going to allow Bryce Young a lot of time. And what ended up happening was that Alabama did not have the players on the outside, the wide receivers, to execute down the stretch. The wide receiver group, the play calling and play design from Bill that O'Brien, part. those things ultimately are what lost the game for Alabama. Mm. My reaction, oh, I wish it was just my reaction, but my reaction was T-boned. My reaction was hijacked by others who were urging me, who were telling me I should be shocked when I shouldn't be shocked that Georgia beat Alabama. 1B finally beats 1A. Okay, that's how it goes. Nick Saban doesn't win the championship every single year. However, you always got to find Alabama if you're going to become the champion. Alabama, Georgia. Alabama, LSU. (laughs) Alabama, Clemson. Alabama, Ohio State. Always Alabama. 
Yeah. And that's the thing about it. They're all tier one programs. I understand even in the 1% where you obviously have your money and your taxes and your shelters. Um, <laughs> even in the 1%. There are percentages in that 1%. There's a 0.1%, yes, right? Private jet like you just like took you. from. Like you like just so took I from. I might be more than me. You're in the point one. <laughs> He's the point one. <laughs> I've heard about it. So here's the thing. <laughs> but we know that when you look at Alabama, that program, they are beatable. Mm-hmm. It's just how do you beat them? And my reaction that didn't get hijacked is there are four pillars of success for beating Alabama. And we just saw Georgia run it. The first one is, Make sure they don't score or run up the points, right? Season low, 18 points. You look at Georgia this year, outside of one game, which was the SEC championship game, all of their opponents, 20 points or fewer. Ding, ding, ding. Also, you got to stop their running attack. Alabama didn't run the ball well last night. We saw second fewest rushing yards. Then you have to go out there and run that rock. And that's what Georgia did with their two-headed monster. Last but not least, affect the quarterback. Just make Bryce Young go out there and throw. This is crazy. You know he's a Heisman winner when you say this. Season high, two picks. Like, season high. (laughs) Two picks is a season high? (laughs) But that's what it was. Those four pillars of success came true, was the foundation that you're talking about for Georgia's success. But please, people, stop hitting me up. Talk about, (gasps) Georgia beat Alabama. Yeah, they are beatable. We just saw one of the instances. Yeah, I'm going to let Clack still speak to the analytics of the game, but... That was the one moment that at the end of the game, I said, this is bigger than Georgia winning a national championship. Like, let's put things in perspective. At the end of the game, it was as though Saban looked, dare I say it, relieved. (laughs) It was as though Saban looked like content. I I listened, I turned the audio up in that exchange, and Saban said, you guys kicked our butts in the fourth quarter, congrats. Kirby Smart replied, how's he doing? He okay? Jameson. Saban replies, I think it's an ACL, but listen, God bless. Kirby says, thanks, coach. I was thinking about this. Clat, you know this, Cell. You'll know it as well as I say it. Nick Saban met Kirby Smart when Kirby was 30 years old. Kirby Smart was a safeties coach for the Miami Dolphins. Now Kirby Smart is 46. I think, Cell, you're 46. I'm thir- you're 47. Yep, I'm 31. To put this in perspective. Mm, don't do it. To put it, in, to, put, <laughs> to, to put it in perspective, Saban in that moment, Clat, and it really just hit me like the impact this dude has had on college football, that his understudy Damn. just beat him in a game, Damn. and Saban wasn't even furious. Saban's like, congrats, you whooped our butts. Yeah. And Kirby wasn't even like, yeah, we did. He's like, hey, how's your players doing? Yeah. Mm. I was like, this is bigger than ball, y'all. Preach, and then preach. I started that's thinking so, about the, so the fascinating. Bro, I started thinking about, about the big yeah. content, context of everything and <clears throat> Saban's legacy. And, and, and I just have to go here for a second, if y'all will uh, oblige, is the, the highest paid black coach in all of sports, Mel Tucker. Well, who'd Mel Tucker coach for? Kirby Smart. Kirby. But before Kirby Smart, who'd he coach for? Nick Saban. Nick Saban. Mm. Jimbo Fisher, the fifth highest paid coach right now in sports and in college football. Who'd he coach for? Nick Saban. Nick Saban. Nick Saban, the second highest paid coach, is Nick Saban. Mm. The tentacles that Nick Saban has left and will leave in college football are greater than just one game. So while I can continue to talk about the analytics, and I will after I make this point, I was watching this story, and I'll be honest, I was just like, yo, because... So you're going to turn the national championship into a tearjerker. It's getting sentimental. Yeah, that's yeah. Here's that's why. This here's, is what I'm hearing. Yes, here. because you when, think he's turning into I, like the I'll, old proud. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. <laughs> I'll give you all this much. Saban got his first national title at Alabama <clears throat> beating who, Joe Clapp? Texas. The University of Texas. Beating my behind in 2009. Mm. And at the time, I was like, yo, I don't care. I would hate to play for Saban. Yeah. I met his linebackers, Dante Hightower, uh, Patriots beast. Yeah. I, met, I was like, I would hate to play for this man. Then I was watching the game yesterday, and I was like, Yo, I got it all wrong. <laughs> so I just, I just, again, clap, it's on you. Okay. But I just had so to there was a lot, the, a lot to unpack there. Okay. Um, where, where to start? Let's first start with this. You, you mentioned, like, you got to beat Alabama, right? They're, they're number one. Did you know that since they beat Texas and won that national championship, there's only been one team win the national championship without having to beat Alabama at some point? Mm. And that was the Florida State team with Jameis Winston. They mm. beat Auburn, who beat Alabama. Uh, and that was the last year, I believe, of the BCS. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you, you got to do everything in your program has to be about beating and, and tracking down Alabama, whether you're in the Big Ten and you're Ohio State or you're Clemson in the ACC or you're another SEC team. Alabama is the, the pinnacle of the sport. Georgia even knows All that. The standard. Okay, now I want to <clears> go to, like, the, the proud papa moment. Huh. I've heard this now twice. Colin told me this the same thing. It was like, oh, it was almost like he was relieved or happy for Kirby and look at it, you know, this guy – 
You don't become Nick Saban by being happy for people. Mm. Mm-hmm. You just don't. Say okay. It, and listen, it. I'm, I, you know what I saw? A smirk. Okay. 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 I brought my youngest team. You should win tonight. Yeah. I brought my youngest team out here and my most dynamic offensive player went down mm. when we knew that we were going to get you. It was kind of like, congratulations. Mm-hmm. You got us in the fourth quarter. Yeah. We'll be back next year. <clears throat> mm. And they will. They mm-hmm. will. See, will. I view it more as he was and is the machine that he always has been. This team is going to be, without a doubt, the number one team in the country and they going into be. next year. Yeah. They've got the best player in college football in Bryce Young, the best defender in college football in Will Anderson. They've recruited at this level. If you are going to beat Alabama at some point in a national championship game, if you're Georgia, you better have recruited at the top end for multiple years in a row, and you better get them when they're not quite yeah. Alabama. And they weren't quite Alabama last night. They weren't Alabama on the outside <clears throat> with the wide receivers. And they weren't as far as their complete roster being so youthful. So I actually viewed it as a nice little smirk saying like, Mm. okay, you got yours. Mm. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. You know when you lose on the playground? When you you were a kid and you lost on the playground and you realized that like, I just didn't have it today. But it's like, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be back. (laughs) Yes, We got school tomorrow. That's what I viewed. And and I might have it totally wrong, but I didn't view him as being happy for Kirby Smart. It was more like, okay. Yeah, I'm more with you, Clad, even though I understand where you're where you're going to, Acho. Um, the youngest version of his team, an injured team, mm-hmm. two of your best receivers get injured in the last three weeks or so. And then it's Georgia who was ranked number one for nine weeks this year, right. and then Alabama for seven weeks. So the shock value has to go away. We have to understand that they're on the same level, even though they don't have the same level of accomplishments. It's interesting when you look at Georgia. In totality, everyone says, damned if you do, damned if you don't. What do I mean by that? You have underperformed in terms of expectations, in terms of talent for years to come, right? We've been talking about since 2017. Oh, you guys lost to Alabama. Come on, Georgia, when y'all going to get over the hump? When you going to get over these ghosts and exercise the demons? Right, right, right. So all those years of underachievement or just choking was based on expectation. Mm -hmm. Now they finally realize the expectation and win a championship, and the first thing people want to do is sit there and say, well, 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 how the hell y'all didn't do this before? And it's like, wait a minute. If I didn't do it before, it's based off of me underachieving. Now I've achieved. Let's move forward. But how can they move forward? Are they going to have the number one recruiting class? No, that'd be y'all. University of Texas. No, Texas A&M. And, and it, why are y'all so sorry? Like, I just don't get this. Like, these top recruiting <laughs> classes is going even, there. They can't even win their own state. Hey, no calm more. down, okay? We're talking I'm about Georgia saying. and Alabama right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring it up because you took me to that place. It's, I thought it was a, like a me versus my son moment when my son gets a good start or mm-hmm. daddy didn't have a shoe tied and, oh, okay, you beat me down. Let's race again, son. And now let me take the governor off. But it wasn't that. It really was, like you said, our dynamic a little bit. I met Acho before Acho even did TV, right? Met him, hair was shorter, you know, suits were baggier. He looked the best. He wasn't the same dude. He didn't have a brooch? He didn't have a brooch. <laughs> Acho was just like, yo, I'm about to go get this. And now I look up, and I meet him at the 50-yard line. He got two Emmys. And I'm sitting there like, mm-hmm. Now, I ain't got a smirk because I ain't going to get an Emmy. I don't know how I'm going to get back at you. But the point is, I understand this dynamic. Alabama has been there. Alabama will always be there. To go to a championship, to get a championship, you got to go through Alabama. Can I say, uh, just back to the game for a moment, uh, outside of this game really was, when it comes down to the execution of the game, Alabama's wide receivers failed Mm. miserably in their execution. Bryce Young, the play before he throws the interception. Oh, dime. He throws an unbelievable ball. Yes. And the wide receiver goes up with one hand. Oh, Dale's it. I'm like, wait, what's going on? The first interception he throws, the wide receiver gives up. Gives up. uh, He doesn't beat the stack. He gets stacked and then just kind of gives up. On the last interception that he threw, everyone's like, oh, he threw it right to the safety. Well, or the corner. No, the outside wide receiver was supposed to be on a clear route. And he just slows but down. But Clack, you know who I mean? Drops, drops off. You, Meanwhile, mm. Bill O'Brien, last night, the offensive play caller for Alabama, was terrible. That's, there we go. That's who terrible. I blame. Terrible. Because if we look at the last interception, and if we want to get analytical, get analytical Let's for a go. second. Alabama, all you needed was a touchdown. You had three timeouts. You had two minutes and change left. Just go down the field and, throw, and get yourself a touchdown. But they must have run four verticals. 
three <laughs> consecutive times. Putting that in layman's terms, all you need is 10 yards. You don't need to get it. You don't need to hit a home run right now. Just hit a single. And I'm sitting there watching this game, and, and I'm losing my mind because I'm like, if you don't give a quarterback, and you know this plan, being a quarterback, if you don't give a quarterback an option but to throw a vertical, he's got to throw a vertical. <laughs> That's right. And That's Bryce exactly Young, right. people are like, well, Bryce Young didn't have to throw it. He absolutely had he to had throw to. it. Because he had nowhere else to throw it. Mm. And the defense is just sitting there waiting on him to throw it. So I'm looking at Bill O'Brien like – you are sabotaging your team. And you guys are defensive players, so you know that when you get inside of the 10-yard line, and, and by the way, Alabama has struggled with this. This is the reason they lost to A&M, by the way. The reason they lost is because they failed offensively inside the 10-yard line. Up. What did they get in that game, just like they got against Georgia last night, which yeah. they struggled inside the scoring area? Man coverage. When you get man coverage down there deep in, in the red area, you've got to bunch the set, you've got to get motion, you've got to create leverage, right? A rocket motion, a jet motion, getting a corner to be running across the formation. Then you've got to start meshing people so that you can get defenders that are hitting each other. They don't have the levels to get over and defend man coverage. Yep. And then you can get out into the flat, you can get a pivot route, you can get to the corner, all these different things. You know what they did there? Same Magnet. exact plan as AM. They just sat there in a static formation and then tried to run their route. I'm like, hey, Bill O'Brien, what are you doing? Just watch the film of last year when Steve Sarkeesian were, was carving people up mm. with motions, formations, and getting Devontae Smith the ball in space. So now he doesn't have his wide receivers. So what should he do? He should get Brian Robinson and Slade Bolden, and they should be moving all over the formation in order to create completions for them, whether it's in the middle of the field and the outside of the field, getting them matchups. He did none of it. Bill O'Brien failed last night, failed miserably. Huh. Tell me this. If Alabama, Georgia were to play 10 times, how many times would Alabama beat Georgia? Is For it, me, it's eight to nine. Is Mechie and Jameson this, yeah, out there? I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, healthy versions healthy, of these teams. I would say it's, I would lean that Alabama would more. win more. Yeah, yeah. I'm more sorry, than I'd say, I would say six. Yeah. I think it's pretty even. We saw them against common opponents this year, four common opponents. The point differential, 112 for Georgia, 39 for Alabama. Like, if you start digging deeper into the Vegas numbers of this, yeah, Georgia had more than a chance to beat Alabama, and they went out there and beat Alabama. I got to give a shout-out to Marcus Stroud, who's a UG alum, former teammate of mine, who has a dog that has not only tattoos but gold chains that are Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, represent my big dog. Respect to you. I just saw Nick Saban just looking at his assistant and said, these are assistants of mine. <laughs> I'm going to let him shine. <laughs> Coming up, seven quarterbacks in the NFC have a shot at the Lombardi Trophy just once. But we'll tell you which one has the most to prove in the playoffs. But first, Bruce Arians said it will be a travesty if Tom Brady is not named MVP. Ain't wrong. Hmm. Tell you if the GOAT should get the hardware. That's next on Speak for Yourself. I see you, Stroud and Dowdy, finally. Now, Tom Brady is right behind Aaron Rodgers for the best odds to win MVP. Now, that's according to Fox Best Sports Book. But his head coach, Bruce Arians, does not think that should be the case. Arians said if his quarterback does not win the hardware, it's, quote, a travesty. And it's not even a close race, quote, mm. quote. Mm. So, Sal, so yeah. should Tom Brady surprise everyone? It's kind of the common thought is that Aaron Rodgers will win. Should Tom Brady win the MVP award? Absolutely, he should win the MVP award. Uh, Tom Brady, statistically, this year has put himself in this position to win the MVP. But for some strange reason, others are thinking that Aaron Rodgers should win this MVP. Now, I'm not Bruce Arians. I know we both got bald heads. Other than that, I ain't got a can go. I'm not Bruce Arians. So I'm not going to go as far as say travesty because that's not my player. However, I am with him in terms of sentiment, like, how can anyone else win this award outside of Tom Brady? He has more passing touchdowns. Passing touchdowns, like, the ultimate determinant of what you're doing at that position is how many times you're getting the ball in the end zone based on you throwing the football. He has more passing touchdowns than anyone. Also has more total touchdowns for all these running quarterbacks, scat backs, 2.0s, all y'all. Add them all up. He still has more total touchdowns than everyone else. More passing yards a game. Why is that interesting? Because between the 20s, a lot of times you could get stopped before the red zone. But he's going up and down the field every single game. More passing yards a game than anyone. And he has the same amount of wins as the guy that everyone is talking about in Aaron Rodgers. So... You add it all up, 
How can you make a case for anyone else? I don't want to get into the injury conversation, the war of attrition conversation, playing with less conversation, age conversation. But I'm prepared for battle. The point is, it's not a travesty, but the front runner needs to be Tom Brady. Um, I'll go as far as saying it is a travesty. I agree with everything you said, however, but Tom Brady should absolutely win the MVP award. And hopefully this argument makes it clear. The only argument that Aaron Rodgers has is that he is more efficient than Tom Brady. Okay. That's the only argument that Aaron Rodgers has for beating out Tom Brady. Okay. But in life, we never care about efficiency. We only care about gross. Mm -hmm. When talking about the richest individuals in the world, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, we don't say, well, how much money do they make per hour worked? <laughs> we just say, Absolutely. how much money do they make? Mm. Across our journey of academia, we don't say, well, how good were your grades per how much you studied? Mm. We just say, did you get straight A's? In the music industry, if you want to talk about artists and their Grammys, well, how many Grammys did they win per albums that they recorded? Mm. We just say, how many Grammys did the artist win in the same <clears throat> manner when it comes down to the MVP award? Why are we saying, well, Aaron Rodgers threw more touchdowns per passes he threw? No, mm. we need to just say Tom Brady threw more touchdowns. Tom Brady had more completions. <clears throat> Tom Brady had more yards. Tom Brady threw for over 5,000 yards at the age of 44. I can leave off at the age of 44 okay, yeah. and just say he threw for 5,000 yards. Only nine quarterbacks have done that in the history of the NFL. Tom Brady has done it twice. So why do we bring up efficiency now when talking about the MVP award when we never bring up efficiency in life? Mm. We don't sit here, Sal, and say, well, Acho, you slept 10 hours last night? Man, I only slept seven, but I slept seven good ones. Mm. No, we say, well, you outdid me. The only time efficiency matters is if efficiency still outdoes gross. But in this case, Aaron Rodgers' efficiency didn't outdo Tom Brady's gross. Aaron Rodgers was more efficient, but he didn't have more touchdowns. Mm. He was more efficient, but he didn't have more yards. He was more efficient, but he didn't have more wins. So I get that Aaron Rodgers was incredibly efficient, but his efficiency still did not outdo Tom Brady. For that reason, mm. to me, it's really unequivocally clear that Tom Brady should win the MVP. Golly, man, I'm not doing TV, y'all, but you know me. I am a defense attorney. So right now, you done activated my law firm, and it's time to pay what you need to pay in retainer because you can't come out here and say it like that, like so wholeheartedly. There's no case for Aaron Rodgers. Now, there is a case. Let's talk about it. Let's go to a family picnic right now. Yes, sir. We ain't going to Nigeria. I saw what happened to you in Nigeria, the family picnic in Compton. We're going to my, my side <laughs> of the safer. Tank. <sighs> Slightly. Different heat. <laughs> Different heat. <laughs> Different heat. Let's stay here in L.A. Okay, family picnic. You and I walk up, and everybody's like, all right, let's play tug of war. You know you're going to get picked on one side. I'm going to get picked on the other mm -hmm. side. Now, this is how we're different in our approaches to life, not just in our takes. When I'm playing tug of war, the first thing I'm looking at is who's on the other side. Because I got to know what they are working with when I'm about to start pulling this rope. You, I know you. You know what you're thinking? I'm Emmanuel Acho. I'm going to pull my hardest. Once I pull my hardest, that's going to be good enough. And I'm looking at you like, Acho, you better recognize and respect what's on the other side. In every conversation we have, you go so full throttle on what you believe, you never look at the other side. They got a gas pedal, too. <laughs> and it's time for you to pump your brakes. Here's the thing. If you are Aaron Rodgers, this is what you activate. You said it. Passer rating. All right, this accumulation of all these statistics to show efficiency. You're right on that. Completion percentage, I'm better than him as well. Okay, a little more of efficiency model, but it does add up to a gross. Passing yards per attempt, ah, oh, man, you're diving in the weeds. Get up out of there. Win percentage, ah. Oh. Giveaways, ah. Oh. You're starting to get to the metrics that make sense that actually add to a case of, hey, why is Aaron Rodgers in this conversation? Not just in the conversation, but the front runner, according to Fox Bet Sportsbook. Now, Acho, let me beat you up one more time Acho. before you beat me up coming back in retort. You always say that there's no model out there where we say work efficiently is better than just the gross work. Mm -hmm. People always talk about, your generation always talks about work smarter, not harder. Yes, sir. Interesting. 
If Tom Brady did all this to just get to the same win number as Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers missed games, Aaron Rodgers created the problems that he had to fix, Aaron Rodgers has a higher win percentage because he has one fewer game, all of a sudden it starts to look like maybe this is attached to today's societal norm of work smarter, Mm -hmm. not harder. I would vote for Tom Brady, sir. But I'm not going to sit there and roll my eyes or side eye anyone who raises their hand to vote for Aaron Rodgers. It sounds like you would. Uh, Here's why. To vote for Aaron Rodgers would to be would be to fall under this lazy narrative in society where the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Mm. The, Even if the wheel doesn't deserve the oil. Why? Mm. If Aaron Rodgers wouldn't have caused so much attention this year, so we would not be talking about him so much that now when talking about him, we're talking that he should win the MVP. Oh, Why? Yes. Aaron Rodgers has not outperformed Tom Brady. Aaron Rodgers has 13 wins. Tom Brady has 13 wins. Does Brady have four losses? Yes. Do the Packers have four losses? Yes. Why did the Packers get four losses and Aaron Rodgers have three losses? Because Aaron Rodgers wasn't available for his team. That part. So, Aaron Rodgers, you must inherit that loss like the Green Bay Packers Mm. inherited that loss. Aaron Rodgers hasn't done anything Tom Brady hasn't done. Here's my biggest issue, my biggest gripe. Mm. If y'all haven't seen J.R. Smith uh, tweet lately, he's, he's going back to school. I don't know what degree he's getting. Uh, if golfing, you know, let me it looks know. like. He's golfing there as well. <laughs> but he's getting a degree, and he's like, bro, why did math introduce uh, letters? Yeah, yeah. And I feel you, so JR. True. As soon as you get to algebra and algebra 2, like, why are we now talking about 2x? Mm. I just know what 2 is. Why are you bringing letters into this? <laughs> this English. I bring that up for this reason. I don't want to have to use division symbols to figure out who my NFL MVP Ooh, should be. Strong. I don't want to have to talk about... Well, what was your completion percentage? Mm. I don't want to have to lead with that. Because to lead with completion percentage is, well, how many completions did you have versus pass attempts? I don't want to have to talk about, well, what was your win percentage? Because to talk about win percentage is now, well, how many games did you win versus how many games did you play? Everybody gets to play 17 games, y'all. So Mm. if you played less than somebody else, that's on you. That's not on them. Well, what was your touchdown percentage? I want to talk about these real, raw, digestible numbers. Mm. Because as soon as you start to talk about percentages and passer ratings and things that introduce division symbols, well, those aren't the raw, easily digestible numbers. Tom Brady outdid Aaron Rodgers in all raw numbers, Mm. and he was equal to Aaron Rodgers in the raw number of wins and losses. Y'all start talking about percentages. Uh Now the game gets a little hazy. It gets a little hazy? hazy. Well, let me clear your vision. Here's some Visine, homeboy. Listen to me right now. I'll give you some simple math. I'll use Tom Brady against Tom Brady. This is what we do in my law firm. But first, let me check my cash app. Make sure your retainer came in. Well, I ain't helping you out if you don't need that help, and I don't get that dough. Here we go. Damn it, I hate to do this. I'm going to make an argument against my argument, even though I like my argument. Tom Brady should win the MVP. But Tom Brady has won the MVP three times before. And in those years, he was top five in completion percentage and passer rating. Right? Okay. Makes sense. Now we're looking at Tom Brady in a different complexion. 2007, first in completion percentage, first in passer rating. Give him the MVP. 2010, fourth and first. 2017, fifth and third. Still wins it. This year, seventh and ninth. Now we're introducing some dudes who ain't even in the MVP conversation that are better than you in some major statistical categories. I'm going to use Tom Brady against Tom Brady to make an argument for Aaron Rodgers. Simple math. I didn't go 2X. Mm-hmm. I didn't go into some quotients. I didn't go into derivatives and all that. Boy. <sighs> I use simple math. I use Tom Brady In some respects, this is the worst MVP version of Tom Brady. I will also say, if you're not your best version as an MVP and someone else is doing well, same number of wins, someone else is being more efficient, someone else is right next to you taking half the strides, we got to start looking at your running form. And I think that's the conversation for some writers, some reporters, some voters out there. Not my conversation, but let's talk to him. But I would caution them because there's a contradiction in that logic. Hmm. Because if you want to use Tom Brady against Tom Brady, then you could very easily and unfortunately use Aaron Rodgers against Aaron Rodgers. Yes. Because last year Aaron Rodgers won the MVP. Mm -hmm. And he had a higher completion percentage last year. It was 71. This year it's 69. He had significantly more passing touchdowns last year, 48. This year, 37. 
He had the same roughly amount of interceptions last year, five, this year, four. So if you want to use an individual against themselves, even Aaron Rodgers will come up short. Mm. If you just want to go Brady versus Rodgers, it's simple. And if you want to have to pair things out or split hairs, the splitting of hairs is also simple. Aaron Rodgers was more than not a detriment and distraction off the field to his team. Okay. Tom Brady Facts. clearly was not a detriment nor distraction off the field to his team, but Tom Brady still had to deal with distractions. So even if we have to split hairs, uh -huh. when it comes down to hair splitting, the nod still goes to Tom Brady. Only reason we're talking all this Aaron Rodgers mm. is because love me or hate me, it is still an obsession, and we are unfortunately obsessed with Aaron Rodgers in the media. Okay, this is my last one. Talk to because me. somebody just sent me a Venmo on top of the cash app, so I got to do a little extra work. I'm going to be up here all night. This year, how many games? 17. 17. Yes, sir. Years past, 30 years or so, we went 16 games. Before that, 14 games, right? So when you start to see, oh, we're adding games, what does that change? That changes the aggregate number, the gross mm -hmm. number, the simple number, right? But it doesn't change the efficiency in terms of numbers. It changes the gross aggregate. Why am I bringing that up? You just brought up the case that Aaron Rodgers is only winning in efficiency numbers, mm -hmm. which is constant no matter how many games you play. Yes, sir. But when you talk about aggregate numbers, who has the most completions ever? Well, yeah, he played more games than Drew Brees. Yeah, he should break his record. Well, this year, total touchdowns, total yards. Yeah, based on the field, he beat everyone else. But he also, if we're going to use this historically, had more games to do it. But then we use the efficiency model, which levels the playing field. Aaron Rodgers stands right there next to Tom Brady and passer rating okay. and completion percentage. Okay, let me now we're merging mathematics and the logic and philosophy. Here's my issue, I think. I think my, my biggest issue is this. Efficiency, the efficiency model is for those with a weak argument. The efficiency model is for those with, with a cowardice argument. Not saying you, but those no, who would defend Aaron Rodgers. No, the reason is... Yeah, I want to say that I'm just as wealthy as Bill Gates compared to how many hours I've worked. Because <laughs> I know that the gross comes down to I am not. You are not. Yeah, man. I, I got as many Emmys as, uh, uh, as Denzel compared to how many times I've been nominated. I'm two for two. At the end of the day, Denzel only two for ten. He only five for ten. That's a weak argument. The efficiency yeah, model yeah, is yeah. for those who know they are losing. They're losing, right. Aaron Rodgers, to use that efficiency model, yeah. is because he knows he uh, cannot beat Tom it. Brady mm. in a true, real model. So mm. as a result, let me find an efficiency argument because mm. that's the only argument where I am actually inefficient yeah. is my argument of efficiency. Golly, man. I needed to hear that about 20 years ago or so when people come up to me. Oh, you're the first one in your family to do A, B, C. I was like... That's efficient. That's gross, too. <laughs> and it's kind of gross that nobody did it before me. Damn it, give me some money, mama and daddy. Coming up, Dak Prescott is trying to get to his first Super Bowl. I'll tell you, Dak or another NFC quarterback has the most to prove in the playoffs. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Seth freaking Rollins is back. What does the return of one of his greatest rivals mean for the Universal Champion? The head of the table, Roman Reigns? Find out on an all-new edition of Friday Night SmackDown. Live at 8 Eastern, 7 Central on Fox. Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers have both lifted a Lombardi trophy. But the other five quarterbacks in the NFC playoffs, Jalen Hurts, Jimmy Garoppolo, Dak Prescott, Matthew Stafford, and Kyler Murray, are still trying to add to their resume. So, Acho, which NFC quarterback has the most to prove in the playoffs? playoffs. This is a tough question. They all have a ton to prove. Matthew Stafford, we know he's 0-3. Kyler Murray, are you great? Are you good? Or are you just overrated? Jalen Hurts, are you the future? Mm. Undisputed. But for me, it comes down to one person. Dak Prescott. Okay. Uh, Sal, I forget what years you were in Dallas. 04, 05. Why you say years? Six. You know I was only there for one year. One year, big dog. One year. 2004. 2004. I stayed over in 2005. So you were before my greatest memory of Tony Romo. I challenge all y'all football fans, especially y'all Cowboys fans, think about the one play you remember from Tony Romo's oh, career. Great. great Cowboys quarterback. Exactly that. What that ball a Bumble go? snap Damn in the playoff. I was there. As great as Tony Romo is, Tony Romo's fumble snap in the playoffs is what we remember the most. As great as Dak Prescott is, we don't have any glowing memories of him in the playoffs. Hmm. We remember Aaron Rodgers outdoing Dak in the playoffs. We remember ah, that Cowboys lost to the Rams when the Rams went to the Super Bowl in 2018 in the playoffs. Dak. But we don't have any standout thoughts of Dak Prescott in these playoffs. 
I think what Dak Prescott has to prove is that he can be a winning playoff quarterback. One and two sounds a whole lot better than one and three. Mm. Two and three sounds a whole lot better than one and three. Mm. And as it stands right now, Dak Prescott's one and two in these playoffs with his sole win coming at home against the Seattle Seahawks in 2018. If you go out there and you lose to the Niners week one when you are at home, now we're going to start to question, like we questioned Lamar Jackson, can Dak win in, in, in the playoffs? Because right now, one and two, yeah, but it's all good. I mean, he lost some tough games, lost to some tough opponents. Mm. But if you lose again in your opening playoff game, you undermine all the success of the regular season, like occurred in 2016. 2016, Cowboys are 13-3. and three. They get the bye. They host the Packers in that second playoff game. Packers come in and knock the Cowboys out the playoffs as fast as the Cowboys got in. So yeah. that, to me, Sal, has more to prove than all these other quarterbacks because for Dak, we need a memory. Mm. We need something that stands out and a positive memory. Oh, uh, man. When, uh, when entertainment, when movies come to life, uh, they hit different, right? Like when you watch something on the big screen, you're like, ah, whatever. But when it hits you like this, you're like, whoa, this is different, right? Like coming to America for you, right? You came to America. Oh, no, you, you just came to America last week, right? You, do that. you saw coming to America, though, right? Both of them. Dak Prescott, you remember this scene in there? He beat Russell Wilson's ass. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's a Super Bowl champion quarterback. How dare you don't have a memory of Dak in the playoffs? I got one. He beat us champion in Russell Wilson. But I am with you on this. There are levels to this in terms of what do you have to prove? And everyone has something to prove. Nick Saban last night has something to prove. How can I distance myself from the rest of these co coaches out there in terms of most national championships? He already has the record. How can I distance myself? You always got something to prove. But boy, Matthew Stafford. <laughs> Meek Mill. Talk about levels to this. This is the Meek Mill of I got something to prove. Why is this? Because Matthew Stafford has reminded them of his greatest issue which is I might not be there for you when you need me most. Mm -hmm. Now, I got this arm talent. I got this cannon. I could throw the ball end zone to end zone, blah, blah, blah. But when you need me most, I might help the other team. I might help the other color as much as I do my own brother. And that's sad. You know what it makes me feel like? And this has happened to you. I'm, I know it has. You ever get that phone call from somebody in your family? For me, it's my cousins. Always, I got bad cousins. Cousins. I ain't got no nephews, so cousins. Oh, man, you know, little Johnny. Going through it. Little Johnny, little Johnny. And then everyone comes up to the same simple, lazy solution. All we need to do is get Johnny away from that school or away from that neighborhood or away from those surroundings. And all of a sudden, he will be miraculously cured. And I'm always the hater on the phone, probably sipping on something, sitting there like, man, he just bad. No matter where he go, there he is. He going to be bad. You don't understand. You over there now got all this money. You don't left in a. OK, let's move Johnny then. I'll take care of it. Of course, I know why I'm on the phone. I got to pay for it. We moved Johnny. And this is a true, I, I changed the name. That's the only thing I did because he trying. But he <laughs> moved from L.A. and he moved to another city. And then all of a sudden, six months later, you get the call. <sighs> I don't know what's going on. What? Little Johnny out here now doing the same damn thing. You know what the Rams are thinking? Matthew, we took you from Detroit, Johnny. All you got to do is now play your part and don't be Detroit, Matthew, Johnny. He out here doing the same damn thing that they said we could remove you from if we just bring you to L.A. and play for the Rams. Man, stop. It's Matthew Stafford, bro. He at the top of what? Something to prove. That's, that's a phenomenal take. And I, it's hard to disagree. Matthew Stafford has a ton to prove. 0-3 in the playoffs. Where I looked and said a little bit differently was this, man. Hmm. Matthew Stafford's never hosted a playoff game. He's always been on the road. Matthew Stafford was in the same division as Aaron Rodgers. He was never winning that division. So you knew Stafford was going to have to go on the road to win his. Okay. Dak's first playoff game, not only did he host, he got an MVP vote that year. He had a bye that year. 13-3 and three that year. One of the best offensive lines the league has ever seen that year. And you still caught you an L. Yeah. Even though you had an extra week to rest, an extra week to prepare, your offense was healthy, and the other team, the Green Bay Packers, not only had to play a game, but they had to come to you. Mm. Now I'm looking again, fast forward, five years, 2021, now 2022 for the playoffs. Cowboys, Niners are going to have to come to you. The Niners are a little bit banged up, particularly at the defensive back position. The Niners are 10-7 and seven to the Cowboys, your 12 wins. Mm. The Niners are a six seed. Cowboys, you sitting there as a three seed. You cannot take a loss to a Niners team that has a quarterback that doesn't even have a fully functioning thumb. Huh. So mm. uh, they all have tons to prove. <laughs> but if you're a Dak, now you're sitting here. You got more to prove than Kyler Murray because you're older and because you're higher paid.
You have more to prove than Jalen Hurts because you're older. You're significantly higher paid. You have more to prove than Jimmy Garoppolo because Jimmy Garoppolo has at least proven mm. he can get to a Super Bowl. Dak and Stafford, that's where it falls. It falls on the feet of those two. Tom Brady, you ain't got nothing to prove in the NFC. Aaron Rodgers, you do have a little bit to prove. I'm sure we'll get there later in the week. Yeah, I know we Sal be hot on that one. Mm. But for me, it's Dak. You get all this praise as a Oof. quarterback of America's team. Mm. We sitting here praising you because you set the Cowboys franchise record for most passing touchdowns. We're praising you because you set it several Cowboys <laughs> records outdoing Tony Romo. Never remembering that the Eagles played no starters in this t- game that you threw five <laughs> touchdown passes, and now we give you all the praise. Don't exactly. tell everybody that. So now, Dak, we got to keep it real with you, big dog. Mm. Take this heat as much as you take this praise because you don't deny the praise. Now it's time for you to prove. Mm. There's different levels of heat. Take the heat. You're right. But it ain't that those McDonald's fries when they just come out and you like, you can't even touch them. You're like, out of the way. You're just looking at that salt on them. You're like, well, I can't wait. These are the soggier ones that Wendy's is trying to get them now on. All right. Here's the thing. Whew, I got a few different ways to prove that Dak is in the conversation. Certainly making the most money, being the star quarterback he is. Come on, man. Like it's time to fill in the blanks. It's time to color in between the lines, some greatness instead of just some goodness. I give you that. But Matthew Stafford, dog. All right, let me start here. You on the Los Angeles Rams. You're playing the Arizona Cardinals this weekend. You're not just playing the Arizona Cardinals this weekend. You're also playing the demons of Matthew Stafford because this is how they are exercised or this is how they live out. Depends on Matthew Stafford. You in the game. You watch Matthew Stafford laser a ball in. Defender jumps in front of it. Oh, completion for 20 yards. You sit there and hit your boy. Ooh, that was close. Why was it close? Because you know you're thinking about them doubt birds. And here's the thing about the doubt birds. They are not on your shoulder. They fly high. They make you look up all the time when you're eating your barbecue. You're looking at the doubt birds because you're always thinking they're going to poop on you. Every time Matthew Stafford throws a ball that's tipped, that's close, that, oh, you're sitting there like, ah, waiting to exhale. And that's going to be the problem. You're facing the Cardinals and you're facing the history of Matthew Stafford. Dak has at least had a good moment in the playoffs. What has Matthew Stafford had in the playoffs? I'm talking about, dog, more giveaways than touchdowns. And three complete games? Come on, man. If you're sitting there, you're looking up high at the doubt birds. Come on, Matthew Stafford. You know what's going on. Coming up, big question in Baltimore. What's going on with my man Lamar Jackson? And his contract in particular tell you if we be hesitant to pay the Ravens star. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Well, the Ravens season is over, unfortunately, if you're a Ravens fan. So the next concern is Lamar Jackson's contract. Now, the Ravens star will be entering the final year of his rookie deal. He spoke for the first time since injuring his ankle back in December and said he has not talked about an extension with the team yet, adding he's worried about getting ready for the offseason. So, hmm, this is a topic I've been waiting. Oh, wow. You want to beef, huh? Should there be any hesitation in paying Lamar Jackson if you're the Ravens? No. Should be no hesitation. You smirk like that again. All right, Nick Saban over here. Smirking that <laughs> Kirby Smart at 50-50. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Let's go where Lamar Jackson took the Baltimore Ravens. Let's go where, without Lamar Jackson, where the Baltimore Ravens are. Did they win any game? Did they win any games without Lamar Jackson since the injury? Did any games? Anybody? I saw L, 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 I mean, L, L, cool, J, L, L, after L. Despite you're seeing glimpses of good quarterback play, competent quarterback play from the backups. Oh, Lamar Jackson is the man that makes this thing go. You can't look at Lamar Jackson and look at him any other way except how do we keep you, how do we make you happy, and how do we retain you at top dollar. Let me give you the reason why you can't have any issue in paying Lamar Jackson. He proved his value to the Ravens even more so than Dak Prescott proved his value in injury last year to the Cowboys. When Dak went down, the first thing we all were thinking was, damn, look how much money went down with him. But then we come to realize that, no, it didn't. Actually, the price tag went up because you saw them sputter mm-hmm. without Dak Prescott. True. Has Dak Prescott ever won an MVP? Has Dak Prescott ever won a unanimous MVP? Has Dak Prescott ever led the league in passing touchdowns, et cetera? No, no, no. That's Lamar Jackson, who went down, and all of a sudden you saw the Baltimore Ravens not find a way up. So because of what Dak Prescott set in precedent, and because Lamar Jackson, love you, Dak, is greater than a Dak Prescott, oh, there's no conversation about his value. It's just how much are you going to pay him? 
Okay, I'm with you there. Okay, I'm okay. with you there. Yes. How much are you going to pay him? Oh, great. But there should definitely be hesitation in how much are you going to pay him. Here's why. And let's just remove our emotions from this conversation. So. If I were to tell you that your starting quarterback were to end his last two seasons injured, you would hesitate a little bit before paying that individual. We're doing this. If I were to tell you that your starting quarterback has been on the decline with his touchdown output the last mm. three seasons, mm but has been on an incline with his interception output the last three seasons, you would hesitate. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Lamar Jackson. Unanimous MVP season. Yes, he was at the heavens, but to see an inverse relationship between his touchdowns, 36, 26, 16, <clears throat> his interceptions, 6, 9, 13, even his average yards per rush are going down. That is worrisome at minimum. It's definitely concerning. Now, if we want to say, should the Ravens commit to Lamar Jackson, well, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Mm. But there should be hesitation in how much. You can't commit to him, in my mind, at a Patrick Mahomes level. No you one can't commit to, Right? You, you yeah. can't commit to him, even in my mind, at a Dak Prescott $160 million Don't level. Don't do that. He's not going to get more than it's that. It's not that Lamar Jackson is not better than Dak. That's not the conversation Ooh. I'm trying to have. Ooh. The conversation I'm trying to have is this. Two years ago, playoffs. The Ravens lost to the Buffalo Bills. Why? Only because of a Lamar Jackson interception. Quarterbacks make mistakes. That's fine. But who got hurt at the end of the game? Lamar Jackson ended that game in the locker room with a concussion. Lamar Jackson ended this season in the training room with an ankle injury. So now two out of Lamar Jackson's four seasons, 50%, he has ended hurt. He has ended unable to compete. I don't care who you are, where you're from, as I'm mm. looking at it, if you've ended your last two seasons injured and your interceptions are increasing while your touchdowns are declining, so we have to have an emotionless conversation about what we are dealing with. Lamar Jackson's talent is unheard of and it is out of this world. But can we have a true conversation of if I'm going to pay somebody Mm. 160 or 200 million dollars because that's what Lamar Jackson would command 160 or 200 million dollars is Lamar Jackson currently getting better is he staying the same or is he getting worse all data su suggests that he's staying the same at best mm. but he might unfortunately be getting worse that's just simply what data suggests mm. okay there's two conversations there's the health aspect and then there's this you're implying they figured out Lamar Jackson to some degree, or he hasn't figured or, out the NFL. Or he hasn't figured out them. Yes, he hasn't figured out the NFL. He's not keeping pace on the treadmill. Okay, I give you that. And now I'm going to disagree with that. Please. Um, did they figure out Lamar Jackson, or did they figure out Greg Roman? One thing that came true and crystallized and became so clear for everyone watching the Ravens without Lamar Jackson is, one, they can't win any games. But more importantly, y'all built this offense around Mark Andrews because Mark Andrews we thought was being force fed the ball because Lamar Jackson didn't go through the proper progressions didn't go through the proper reads come on Hollywood Brown needs more targets even though Hollywood Brown has fixed his drop issues to a large degree you got to get the ball around spread it around let's get him Sammy Watkins whatever you want to say about it you were looking at Lamar Jackson and slighting him because of his offensive struggles you come to realize that since he's gone in his absence, they just got a focal point offense based on a tight end named Mark Andrews. Bruh, it's easy as a defender, as you were a defender, to figure out an offense if they really going to go out there and feature the tight end. Mm -hmm. You got to have dynamic playmakers that are threats consistently, taking the top off of the defense consistently for us to really be compromised as a defense. But that's not the Ravens. So I would suggest if anyone's been figured out, it's not Lamar Jackson. It's Greg Roman once again. Now, let's go past that point because I have talked about that at nauseum. I don't know. Um, you say if your touchdowns decrease, but your interceptions go up, something wrong with you, right? Okay, what if your touchdowns decrease, but your interceptions stay the same? Are you just, eh, You could argue that you're staying the same. You could argue that. Okay. Well, you know that happened with Aaron Rodgers the last couple of years. I wonder if people are looking at him with suspicion. I wonder if people are looking at Aaron Rodgers like, hey, the interception's the same, but the touchdowns, where are they going? We don't do that to Aaron Rodgers because we know that Aaron Rodgers is great. People don't believe that Lamar Jackson is great, even if they're believers of Lamar Jackson, because they have to deal with so much criticism, so many naysayers. 
But if I'm looking at Lamar Jackson in the system, all I'm saying is you are the system. And now we have to dress you up appropriately. Your greatest argument is the one you haven't made just yet. And I know I'm going to beat you to the punch. If you give Lamar Jackson all this money, what you going to do? Because right now they don't have the proper resources surrounding them. Get healthy at running back. I get it. Right receiver right now, not good enough, not potent enough. What you going to do once you pay Lamar Jackson? Different conversations, but you got to pay Lamar Jackson. So you do have to pay him, but it comes down to what are you going to pay him? Okay. I just don't know that you can pay him uh, four years of guaranteed money. Can we do this? Talk to me. He's better than Dak Prescott, right? Yes. And his contract is coming after Dak Prescott. You know that's simple math. You pay him more. Mm-hmm. You can't pay him less but than what Dak. But what you can do is this. You can give him two years $90 million, as opposed to how Dak Prescott got his 4 160 You could pay him higher per year, but not commit as long. Here's why I'm worried, and I won't blame Greg Roman. Oh, Even with Tyler Huntley and John Johnson, 35 years old, their touchdown-interception ratio was better than that of Lamar Jackson. Those two quarterbacks over their games, five touchdowns, four picks. That breaks down to 15 touchdowns, 12 picks. Mm. Lamar Jackson had 16 touchdowns, 13 picks. Tyler Huntley, he had two rushing touchdowns in his four starts. Lamar Jackson had two rushing touchdowns in his 12 starts. I'm not saying Huntley is as good as Lamar, no. No. What I'm saying is I'm not going to sit here and blame Greg Roman when his quarterbacks, albeit being Tyler Huntley undrafted or 35-year-old Josh Johnson, his quarterbacks had the same output as Lamar Jackson Mm. when they went in with minimal experience, and they're not unanimous MVPs. Yes. Pay Lamar. No doubt. But, so you, I think you would be lying to me if you were to say that you weren't concerned about the fact that he hasn't finished the last two seasons healthy. Uh. If you were to say you weren't concerned about the fact that he's thrown 20 less passing touchdowns this year than he did two years ago, yet he simultaneously threw seven more interceptions this year than he did two years ago. Mm. Like, that is incredibly concerning. Mm. He had a season worth of touchdown interception difference. 20 less <laughs> touchdowns and seven more picks in this season than that unanimous MVP season. You, I'd be lying to myself to say I ain't concerned. Okay. Who had more interceptions this year? Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson? Hey. Um, more games. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let's talk. Let's have fights. Let's just do it all. Who has the most wins at the age of 25 or under in NFL history? Lamar. Okay. You know what you're selling me? You're selling me a situation that has a limit, that has a cap on it, that has a glass ceiling that we don't want to fully expose. Greg Roman is a greater problem than Lamar Jackson. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. I didn't know how to play basketball. I did not. I literally will get picked first in every pickup game I ever walk into a gym from the age of 10 on because I just look like I could play some basketball, right? And that was the first game. By the second game, they were trying to figure out how to get me off their team because they're like, dog, you can't play basketball. But I also knew who to play with. I also know which teams I could play on. And I played basketball, organized basketball before. You can hide me in your system. Here's the thing. There's a cap to Greg Roman's system where anybody gets plugged into it, they will immediately activate at full strength. And you're just like, damn, the backup looked good. Colin Kaepernick did it, right? Mm-hmm. Damn, you can look at Lamar Jackson. Damn, he did it. Then he would take it to new heights. Then you'll bring someone else in, they'll look like a replica. You bring me on your team, he looked like he can play basketball right here. Knowing that I can't. Why do I bring all this up? Because Greg Roman knows, and now we have now found out, that whoever you put in there is going to look good to a point. Okay. And then at that point, what do we do now? Only Lamar Jackson has been able to take this team, the Ravens, to a greater point. Win ball games without Lamar Jackson if you're going to tell me it's not about Greg Roman. I got to say this. Greg Roman is the best thing that's ever happened to Lamar Jackson. Oh, they're doing this Here's too. why. Here's why. Listen to me for a second. Here's yes, why. Yes, sir, sir. Yes, sir. What's the, the biggest compliment we pay to Lamar Jackson? And in all honesty, the, the, the only thing that grants Lamar Jackson immunity, because there's a lot of things he should not be immune for. The fact that he hasn't thrown for over 4,000 yards, the fact that he rarely throws for 300 yards in a game, the fact that he only won one playoff game. There's a lot of things Lamar Jackson should not be immune for. But the one thing that grants Lamar Jackson ultimate immunity, he was a unanimous MVP. It don't matter what you say. Yeah, but I won unanimous MVP. That's not it. It's but the, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah, the biggest that's, one. That's the biggest that's one. Lamar's get out of jail free card. As he's he a should unanimous. Exactly right. Oh. But he was a unanimous MVP. 
because of the likes in large part of Greg Roman. The same reason Colin Kaepernick has an NFL record for most rushing yards in a playoff game was because of Greg Roman. Yes. So what made Lamar Jackson Lamar Jackson and what made Colin Kaepernick yes. Colin Kaepernick yes. is Greg Roman. So we can't now look at uh -huh. the person who made Lamar Jackson and then be like, well, that's the biggest problem with Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. Without Greg Roman, we wouldn't even be able to grant Lamar Jackson immunity. Oh, let me tell you why you can. What makes Lamar Jackson is what's breaking Lamar Jackson. It's because Greg Roman is not reinventing himself. You know this. I know this. My best move, the best move that I could perform was a dent rip. Okay. Go into a game saying this is my best move and do it all game long. What's going to happen to your best move? All of a sudden, it doesn't look too good, does it? That's the thing about Greg Roman in the system. He keeps saying, this is the way I play. This is the way I coach. This is the way it's going to go. No matter who you give me, they're going to look good. Here's the problem. Then the defensive coordinators are sitting there like, is that all y'all going to keep doing? Y'all going to keep doing this? No, no, no. This got to be. Let's watch more game film. They doing that still? There's going to be a limit to what they do because what makes you will break you if you don't reinvent. All I'm asking for is a reinvention. Maybe that will have to come from a different place. Lamar, get your money, big dog. Coming up, Frank Reich did not really give Carson Wentz a vote of confidence yesterday. Nope. Tell you if the coach should commit to their quarterback next. Oh, another spicy one. Oh, speak for yourself. Get your money in there. The coach just had to beat the lowly Jaguars, my Jaguars, and they were in the playoffs, but they did not. Carson Wentz had two turnovers, and the coach have to watch the postseason at home like me. Winston's future as Indy's quarterback was brought up to his head coach, Frank Wright, yesterday. Take a listen. Uh -oh. I know it's the day after the season, but as you sit there right now, do you expect Carson Wentz to be your quarterback in 2022? We love the team we had this year. We knew everyone we brought in this year. Uh, we expected to play winning football. Next year's roster will be next year's roster. Um, I'm not going to evaluate or talk about any. I don't want to just open it up with one player and then start talking about all of them. So. Mm. Dang, should the coach commit to Carson Wentz after that? <laughs> uh, for now, and for the $28 million that Carson Wentz is mm. supposed to be paid, yes. Um, in mm. the same manner that I just talked about Lamar Jackson and the way in which Lamar Jackson was trending, 36 touchdowns two years ago, uh, 26 touchdowns last year, and 16 touchdowns this past year, six interceptions, nine interceptions, 13 interceptions. I look at Carson Wentz and the way in which he's trending. Carson Wentz did not play great by any stretch of the imagination. He did not play terribly. Okay. But if you look at how Carson Wentz is trending, how atrocious he was last year. This three wins, now nine wins. How atrocious he was last year. 16 touchdowns, 27. Last year, 15 interceptions, seven. Look at the way in which Carson Wentz is trending. Then I would absolutely commit to Carson Wentz for right now for that price. When I look at how Carson Wentz is trending, I'm like, okay, big dog, I am not sold on you that you are back. Okay. But I will go ahead and purchase you right now with what you're asking me to purchase you for. Carson Wentz is the only quarterback to have played 17 games and throw seven interceptions or fewer. Carson Wentz and Aaron Rodgers are the only two quarterbacks to have played 15 or more games and, play, and, and thrown seven interceptions or fewer. Mm -hmm. So Carson Wentz was second best or best when it comes down to protecting the ball based on how many games he played. Carson Wentz was 10th in passing touchdowns. So when I look at it, as bad as we want to say Carson Wentz was, and we yeah. can say that, oh, he lost to the lowly Jaguars. If you watch the game, you recognize it was not exclusively on Carson Wentz. His offensive line got no push. His defensive line got no penetration. But if you're going to be 10th in passing touchdowns and best or second best in interceptions, I might not win with that, but I ain't going to lose with that. Mm -hmm. For that reason, I would say yes, I'll commit to Carson Wentz. You would say yes, ultimately. Yes, Woo! You know what you sounded like the entire time? Half pregnant. And that's not a thing, but that's what you tried to sell me on. <laughs> <laughs> you tried to sell me on both sides of the coin, but I can't look at both sides at once. I got to pick one. And I'm not going to pick committing to Carson Wentz. Let me tell you why. One, there are precedents. There is a precedent set already with Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield, to me, reminds me of Carson Wentz in terms of storyline, trajectory. Like, you, you can look at one side and say, yeah, yeah, keep Baker Mayfield. Mm -hmm. Made it to the playoffs and look at that one season. And then you can flip it around and say, oh, but look at Baker Mayfield. And I think Carson Wentz is trending in that same direction in story, narrative. Therefore, if I'm the Indianapolis Colts, do I want to commit to what the Cleveland Browns are going through? Okay. And what is that? Woo, Carson Wentz. 
there's a deal breaker out there. There's one thing you can't do, and that's remind us of who you were in Philly at okay. the end. And if you do that, then guess what? All bets are off. And he did that. Let me tell you how. He didn't do it by himself. Not only did Carson Wentz go out there and play C plus ish this year, but he was surrounded by A pluses. Baker Mayfield. Surrounded by a running game. Jonathan Taylor may have had one of the greatest running yes, back sir. seasons ever. Let's just go on record and suggest that maybe Jonathan Taylor in the running game won't ever look this good again. And that won't be a slight. Mm -hmm. So you won't have a greater balance ever again. And even if you do, what did that get you this year? What will that get you going forward? Now, this offensive line, there are moments where you saw them and they were like, that's not living up to the standard, living up to the reputation of them. But it's still one of the top offensive lines in the game. Top offensive line, you got you the best running game this year of all running games in the NFL. Then you have, I don't know, you have some assets on the outside. When you look at you had a receiver over 1,000 yards, you helped contribute to that. But at the same time, what did we do with that? Now, all of what I just said has to be in contrast to what did we do last year? We had to beg an old man to come out of retirement and play just one more year before he went to coach high school football. So his heart may have been in it. His heart may not have been in it. But we know what was better results. We got better results from a semi-retired guy who comes back and wins more games than you, Carson Wentz. And then you come out here this year with the greatest running game, with a tremendous offensive line, and give us less than what that guy did. And everyone told us that he wasn't our long-term future, largely because of age. Why are you our long-term future? Worst results. You have now reminded us of your greatest issue, which is when we need you most, last two games of the year, Jacksonville game, last game of the year, you will give us the lease. Man, I'm sorry. I'm not signing up for what Cleveland's going through. I can't commit to Carson. So here's what's most concerning about Carson Wentz. Let's be real. Carson Wentz left Philadelphia, and Philadelphia won five more games than it won last year. There you go. Carson Wentz shows up to Indy, and Indy wins two less games sure. than it did last year. Sure. You do not want to be that common denominator, Carson Wentz. And right mm -hmm. now, Carson Wentz is that common denominator. That is absolutely troubling and terrifying. But here's the positive, Sal. If it's not Carson, then one, who is it? But the better question and the better conversation is, I'm never going to jump off of something that's trending upward. If Carson Wentz is thrown 27 touchdowns this year and just 16 last year, if he only threw seven interceptions this year and 15 last year, why would I ditch it now? Mm. Because how much higher might, might it go? You saw if he throws another 11, if he has another 11 touchdown improvement, that's 38 touchdowns next year. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to assume he's going to cut his interceptions once again in half and throw four next year, throw three interceptions next year. But I at least want to find out. You know what it is. You go to the casino. If things are good, you don't lower your bet while you're winning. No. You either stay or you do what's called pressing, and yeah. you bet more. Now, the Colts may not collectively be winning, but Carson Wentz individually, he winning right now, statistically speaking. So I'm not going to get up from the table while Carson Wentz showed vast improvement, I'm going to at least sit around and let me just keep my bet the same, which is continue to play with Carson Wentz. Let me keep my bet the same and just see what Carson Wentz has to offer. Make no mistake about it. Who were the Colts receivers this year? An aging T.Y. Hilton, who yeah, I said yeah. before the game, Insane. he doesn't really have that much left in the tank. Pittman. Pittman Jr., second-round pick, who made some big plays, but it's not like Carson Wentz is out there like Joe Burrow out there with Jamar Chase with Higgins. Carson Wentz isn't out there like Ryan Tannehill's out there with A.J. Brown and Julio Jones when he's available. He's not even out there uh, uh, like Patrick Mahomes is out there with Tyreek Hill, with Travis Kelsey, with Miko Hardman. Of all the AFC teams that actually made the playoffs, Carson Wentz has the least amount of help outside of Mac Jones. Mm. So when I look at it, mm. you were one game least away. One, least amount of help offensively. Yeah, Receiving game? Nice. Nice. That was the nicest. He's nice. <laughs> nice. Now, when I look at all what? the weapons that Burrow has, that Mahomes has, what? that Herbert has, you told me yesterday, Austin Eckler running back for the Chargers, 20 yeah. touchdowns on the season? Mm -hmm. Carson Wentz didn't have a ton of help this year, man. Yeah, but look, Jonathan Taylor had 18 this year. Let's not do that. Um, here's, the, here's the issue. Does management have an argument against you? Do they have a strong argument against you? Yes, they do. Carson Wentz, you can't come up to me with your agent saying, judge you off for your worst performances, which were last year in Philly, 
and then say, look at it. The arrow's pointing up. It's like, dog, I can't give you props for just being normal now because <laughs> you were horrible before. The same way, all right, Carson, since you want to have this conversation, let's judge us, the Colts, off of last year. Well, we're worse off, as you said. So I'm not winning right now if I'm the Colts. I'm at the table. I'm not winning. Guess what? I'm going to lower my bet. I'm going to lower my bet on you, Carson Wentz, because we're not winning right now because, in part, of you. So Carson Wentz wants to sit there and retort. Oh, no, no, I'm better than I was. Carson Wentz was winning at the dollar table. I'm not slighting anybody at the dollar table, but let me just say this. You at the dollar table, ain't a lot of people screaming and going crazy over there. Like, they like to see the big chips and the chips that even I can't even put down, right? That's when you lose your mind. Like, yo, big stakes, and you show up. Big stakes, beat Jacksonville you in. Big stakes. That's when they screaming. What did he do? <sighs> Man, he didn't play his hand right. And you got to understand, when you got to run a game like that, when you have players like this, when you have defensive players like this, like, even Frank Wright wanted to say this, but he didn't say it. Let me decode it. Dog, we had everything we needed, and Carson Wentz kind of took us back to what Carson Wentz was in part of what we acquired. They only got Carson Wentz because he fell off. And now he reminded Sal, them of why he let me, fell let me, off. Okay, let me ask you this, though, because I think we'd all be lying to ourselves okay. if we gave different answers than you should to this question. If I said, hey, Carson Wentz is going to throw more than 25 touchdowns this year, you would be like, oh, snap, I'll take that. Take if I said, hey, Carson Wentz is going to throw less than 10 interceptions this year. You'd be like, oh, snap. Heck, yeah, I'll take that. Now if I were to say, hey, Carson Wentz will throw more than 25 touchdowns mm -hmm. while simultaneously throwing less than 10 interceptions, you would be on the shadow of a doubt take that. Mm. And that's what Carson <clears throat> Wentz did. Yeah. So I'm not saying that it translated into victories because it didn't, particularly in the last game against the Jaguars when they needed it most. But watch the tape. That's not all on Wentz. That's not even predominantly on Wentz. But Carson Wentz exceeded expectations this year, largely exceeded expectations this year. Why mm. would you not commit to him at least for one more year and just see what's really good? Because You're already paying him. You're already on a hook for 15 mil. Yeah, I tell you what, I also would not be so encouraged by. It. You told me that Carson Wentz was going to have the 27th ranked passing yards per game of all quarterbacks. They're only 32. <sighs> Carson, you ain't got that much better. We did that in Philly. When you told me he would be 25th in passer rating, come on, Carson, again. When you told me he would have eight, ga eight games of lower than a 62 passer rating, eight games, that's damn near half the, half the season. I would just sit there. Like I said, you made a great argument. That's the other side of the coin. I'm going to flip it. And this is what you have to understand about any negotiation. Carson Wentz knows this. You know this. We all know this. Don't give him ammo. Don't give him the hammer because they're going to swing it. And I think in this situation, when we needed you most, because it wasn't just an aggregate number conversation with Carson Wentz. It was, this is the same guy that they drafted a second rounder, and all of a sudden, mentally, he got frazzled and he tapped out. Okay, that's fine, because Frank Wright wasn't with you. Frank Wright gets you back. I'm going to get those numbers back up. Now, Carson, I can't fix this part. When we need you most, be Carson Wentz. Be the guy who was in MVP conversation. Be the guy from the small school that made it big. But he went back to the old Philadelphia Carson Wentz. You know what Carson Wentz is? You go, you know Usher? You like Usher? Mm -hmm. You go to the Vegas? Did you see Usher? Uh, I see oh, you ain't got the money like that. Okay, I did that front row. You know what I'm saying? No, I was in the back. Um, here's the thing. Usher had this song that uh, I think is appropriate for Carson Wentz. You remind me of a guy <laughs> that I once knew. Used to wear number 11. Switched it to two. <laughs> but you're still playing like some move. Coming up, I will tell you went to MC quarterback <laughs> as the most approved in the playoffs. Uh, That's next. Don't speak for yourself. As long as you didn't say let him burn, I was going to be all right. <laughs> I was going to be all right. Oh, well, let's move on to the NFL. Seven quarterbacks in the AFC have a chance to win the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes, Ben Roethlisberger, they already know what that feels like. But Josh Allen, Mac Jones, Ryan Tannehill, Derek Carr, Joe Burrow are looking for their first shot in lifting the Lombardi Trophy. A lot of quarterbacks, a lot to prove, a lot on the line. Marcellus, which AFC quarterback has the most to prove in the playoff? Woo, uh, this is tough. I'm not going to lie. I was on the fence, ripped my jeans, trying to figure out which side I was going to fall on. Was it going to be Josh Allen? Was it going to be Patrick Mahomes? Let's talk through this. It's both of those guys. One of them is going to win this conversation. Uh, Patrick Mahomes was in the Super Bowl last year. Mm -hmm. For him to go out there and lose in the playoffs at any level, let alone first round against who? The retired for most of the game. Oh, 
Oh, the Chargers called timeout. Now I'm not retired again. Ben Roethlisberger. Steelers? Woo! You imagine? We came in here after that game and had to talk about that performance. No matter what Patrick Mahomes did, he didn't beat the retired, now unretired Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. But there's also a Josh Allen who was in the AFC Championship game last year who was amazing, who got paid, who leads the Bills, who the Bills, well, even without a running game, Josh Allen still keeps them afloat. But now, Josh Allen, you go out there and lose to the quarterbacks, the likings of who's out there. Ryan Tannehill, uh, Joe Burrow, Derek Carr, Mac Jones, and I said Ben Roethlisberger. Whoever you pick outside of Patrick Mahomes, if you see Josh Allen lose to any of those quarterbacks, you start to tell yourself, how are they catching you and passing you up already? That can't happen for Patrick Mahomes. That can't happen for Josh Allen. So I think I'm coming up here to say, long story short, neither one of those quarterbacks can lose to these other quarterbacks because I think there's a gap in tier between those two and the rest. I like that. Um, the AFC quarterback with the most to prove is the biggest enigma in the NFL, Derek Carr. Oh. Derek Carr might be the most underrated quarterback in the NFL. He might be the most overrated quarterback in the NFL, depending on how you rate Derek Carr. Mm. Since 2014, Derek Carr has been to not one, two, but three Pro Bowls and an MVP vote. The other four quarterbacks on that list, all first ballot Hall of Famers. Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Mm. Drew Brees. Those are the other quarterbacks on the list with the likes of Derek Carr that have three Pro Bowls and an MVP vote since 2014. Yet, we scoff at Derek Carr being a top 10 quarterback, and we don't mention him being a top five quarterback. Why? Because he's only been to the playoffs once, and he was hurt and didn't even play. But remember, Derek Carr has had five coaches in his seven-year NFL career. Derek Carr has weathered the storm this year of losing his head coach, John Gruden, his first-round pick, uh, Henry Ruggs, and defensive first-round pick, Damon Arnett, not just losing them, but having all the drama and turbulence in the world. If Derek Carr goes out and has a successful playoff run, Zincel, in my mind, he catapults himself once again into the top tier of NFL quarterbacks. Here's why. We already know Justin Herbert was a top flight quarterback. Yeah. And we know Brandon Staley's a top flight coach. It was a must win game. Win and you're in, lose and go home. And somehow Derek Carr and his non-head coach head coach beat one of the greatest young head coaches in football and one of, if not the greatest young quarterbacks in football. Mm. Derek Carr is starting to chip away at those who disrespect his name. He's starting to gain the respect of those who didn't put respect on his name. But the, you got to cement it in the playoffs. Derek Carr is the biggest enigma in the National Football League. You don't know what to feel about him. You don't even know of his existence. But remember, he was once the highest paid quarterback in all the ball. Five yeah. years, 125 mil. He's coming up on a contract year sale. He got one more year left on his deal. His five-year, $125 million deal is poverty money for the NFL quarterback position right now. He signed for 70 guaranteed. Dak Prescott got 75 in this year alone. Derek Carr got a whole bunch to prove, Sal. Ah, man, I thought most to prove was the one who had most to lose. And Derek Carr is not in that position because, one, his expectations are the middle of the menu. Like, you'll go to Cheesecake Factory, you'll be like, but you get about the fifth play, you're like, man, look, I don't even give a damn. You're just going to pick something, just right? Just the bread. Yeah, just keep, <laughs> keep it simple. Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. I ain't trying to go in the middle of the menu and start finding Derek Carr specials. Here's the problem. If you're Derek Carr, you got greater issues, too. Go home. You live next door to Chucky still. You, you know he lived next door to John Gruden. Mm-hmm. Well, they bought the house next you. He had the teacher's pet apple. Hey, I'm going to move next to my coach. Yeah, how that racism and misogyny? All this crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine going home every day, having fun in Vegas. Got to go home to racism. I digress. Let's talk about this situation. Who has more to lose, Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes? Hmm. People going to call me a hater? It's Patrick Mahomes. Why? Because we know he has more to lose, so he has more to prove. Patrick Mahomes, is this Super Bowl a bust? That's your favorite thing to throw out, especially playoff time. Isn't this Super Bowl a bust for Patrick Mahomes? You always tell me that. If you don't win a Super Bowl, it's a failure. Well, especially for a Patrick Mahomes, correct? Now let's talk about why he has something to prove. Because it's been a roller coaster ride this year. Admit it. Patrick Mahomes, career worst in losses. Five. Career worst. Not that bad, but still his worst. Career high in interceptions. His worst. Lowest passer rating of his career as a starter. His worst. And then even if he gets to the Super Bowl, he still has to exercise the demons in the Super Bowl. You want to hear his stats in the Super Bowl? We were talking about Matthew Stafford. 57 percentage, percent completion percentage. Two touchdowns, four interceptions. That's more giveaways than touchdowns. And a 64 passer rating. 
more to prove? It's the one who has more to lose in a Super Bowl Here, bust. Here's why I don't think it's Mahomes. And let me now, you know, dive and tangle in your argument for a second. Uh. Um, you said, let's talk about his stats in the Super Bowl. I'd love to talk about Josh Allen's. Facts. But we can't. Facts. I'd love to talk about cars, but we can't. Right. I'd love to talk about all these other players, but we can't. If Patrick Mahomes doesn't go to the Super Bowl, or if he goes to the Super Bowl and loses, he's still maybe the greatest young quarterback of all time. He's still... Mm-hmm. A, a Hall of Famer already, probably yeah. first ballot, just based off what he's already accomplished. Yeah. So Patrick Mahomes is still a made man. Josh Allen is by no degrees a made man. He's made only in his pocketbook, <laughs> point blank, period. Ooh. Josh Allen, we don't even know if he's top five still. Remember last year, he was second Ooh. in the MVP vote. But this year, we're looking at Josh Allen like, wait a second, big dog. Y- y'all were only 10 and 6? Wait a second, big dog. Or 10 and 7 or 11 and 6, excuse me? Like, wait a second, Josh Allen, who are you? For me, so having to prove something is proving that you're a made NFL quarterback. Mm. And Patrick Mahomes is the only AFC quarterback, along with Ben Roethlisberger, different conversation. But Mahomes is the only AFC quarterback that's a made man. Uh. Ryan Tannehill, he's not. Uh. Joe Burrow, not. Mac Jones, obviously not. Derek Carr, technically he should be. But we don't talk about him like he is. Then Josh Allen. Josh Allen ain't nobody made, man. So if it is going to come down to Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, it's absolutely Josh Allen because we know who Patrick Mahomes is. Win or lose, he's still incredibly great. Josh Allen, if he spazzes again, you're going to come on television like, ah, here goes Josh Allen again. <laughs> My brother from another doing it again. Um, you better put some respect on his name. Who that? Birdman teardrop. Josh Allen. Yeah, you boy. No other AFC quarterback has more passing touchdowns this year than Josh Allen, but Patrick Mahomes. And you told me he's a made man. Mm-hmm. Nobody else? Keep going through that list. Go. Yeah, none of them. Okay. And only one has more wins this year, and that's Ryan Tannehill. Nobody else. Like, he's in rare air still, even in decline, as you want to say, even in regression, as you want to say. Now, it wasn't the best of year for Josh Allen. That was last year. But still, he's in position to If Josh Allen goes out there and balls out, to be a made man, why? He'll win a Super Bowl this year. To win a Super Bowl this year will put you in the same position as Patrick Mahomes in terms of Super Bowl wins. Isn't that crazy? I just don't understand how we have this huge gap between where Patrick Mahomes is and, let's say, a Josh Allen. But if he goes out there and does it, go on a four-game win streak, he's where Patrick Mahomes. Who the reason is, is though, Cell, is because that's such a gigantic, monumental if. It is. Big dog. It's like uh, if you or I had a gold medal, we'd have the same amount of gold medals as a gold medalist. <laughs> well, sure, but that's such a monumental well, chasm. Yeah, at least in the race. He's we in the race, shape. but there's a great chasm in winning that Super Bowl. Yeah, Patrick yeah. Mahomes, if he wins another Super Bowl, he got more than Aaron Rodgers. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, Patrick Mahomes wins another Super Bowl. I like that he got the same too. as Peyton Manning. Yes. So it's just that's such a huge chasm chasm to catapult somebody based on the assumption or the hope that they okay. might win another Super Bowl. Okay. Patrick Mahomes, made man. Josh Allen, more made. But Derek Carr ain't made in any capacity. Okay. That's why I'm with Carr. But if it's between Allen and Mahomes, mm. I'm going to go with Allen on that one, big dog. Interesting. Uh, y'all got to help us out on social. Real talk. I, I, that mean more to prove, more to lose. Who's the made man? Oh, that was interesting. Coming up, Bill Belichick has been named coach of the year one, two, three times. What about number four? Tell you who deserves the award next on Speak for Yourself. The NFL regular season is a wrap. So it's time to give out our Coach of the Year award. There are plenty of deserving candidates, including Mike Vrabel and Matt LaFleur, who led their teams to number one seeds, and of course, Bill Belichick, who has his team back in the postseason with a rookie quarterback, Tracho, who deserves to be Coach of the Year. I got to give this one to Mike Tomlin. Oh. Mike Tomlin, and, and for several reasons. Number one, you start off one and three. You pivot from one and three to going two and five. Teams that are two and five have made the playoffs 7.1% of the time. But forget being one and three and two and five. That was early in the season. When we got to December, huh. when we got to the end of the season in December, the Steelers were five, five, and one. The Steelers had the fewest wins in their division of the AFC North. Fewer wins than the Browns, than the Ravens. And the Bengals. The Steelers were the 11th best team in the AFC. Mm. Only the top seven make it to the playoffs. So we get to December, and the Steelers are 5-5-1 five, five, and one, with such slim chances of making the playoffs. Mm. You've been there, Marcellus. I've been there. you already starting to think about your vacation plans. <laughs> Stop it. You're yep. looking up a few in the Steelers' locker room like, yo, we got five wins. Mm. 
The Ravens got eight. We ain't finna make the playoffs. Let's do, oh, hey, where are you trying to go for the summer? You going to Bahamas? Hey, let's do Turks, big dog. Let's do, I ain't never been to the Cayman Islands. Yeah, we can do that. That is what Steelers players probably had a propensity to do. Man. If not, for head coach Mike Tomlin and his greatness. Yeah. Mike Thomas rallies the troops. Mind you, early December is also when Ben Roethlisberger comes out and says, y'all know what, this is going to be my last season, allegedly. Mm. So Mike Tomlin is dealing with an aging quarterback who's announcing that he's going to retire. He's dealing with a team that's 5-5-1 five, five, and one, and somehow miraculously rallies that team against all odds, even the last game of the season. Because I'm going to say this, then I'm going to shut up. The last game of the season, remember how much had to go right for the Steelers? Yeah. Steelers had to beat the Ravens. The Steelers had to hope the Jaguars beat the Colts, which should not have happened by mm -hmm. any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And then even after all that happens, Steelers have to hope that the Raiders and the Chargers mm -hmm. don't collude to tie, which would have been in the better interest of the Raiders and Chargers. Mm -hmm. And all that still went right. I know, big dog. Yeah, yeah, every time you say it. Uh. <laughs> so the fact that Mike Tomlin was able yeah. to rally those troops mm. from two and five to mm. making the playoffs, he should win coaching. Mm, Mike Tomlin, you say. Yes, Mike sir. Tomlin, huh? Well, you got the first word right. It's Mike Vrabel. Oh, man, come on, man. I love me some Tomlin, but a team dealing with retirement talk from their quarterback that they kind of wish retired already is not the same as a team that played without their team MVP for more games than they played with him this year. He was out more than he was in. Come on, Derrick Henry? That's good. Whoa. Y'all were 6-2 and two with Henry. And six and three without him. And Tannehill wasn't having a great season. Mm -hmm. And somehow, some way, we stayed afloat. Somehow, some way, we got our number one seed. The first time we had a number one seed since 2008. We used 91 different players this year. That is an NFL record for a non strike season. Yeah, I would have crossed the picket line too, damn it. So you look at this team, not just Derrick Henry gone. Julio Jones missed what? Seven games. AJ Brown missed five games. Man, will you stop? This team was out there tilting top seed in the AFC with one Pro Bowl player, Kevin Bayard. <sighs> Mike Vrabel earned it, brother. I mean, look, he's had four winning seasons, his first four seasons, all winning seasons. He's been balling. There's some momentum behind him, but this year, oh, stellar effort. Uh, Mike Vrabel's amazing. I can't yeah, take on. anything away from him, but I'll just try to put things in perspective for That's why I would err on the side of Tomlin. Okay. Remember the division Mike Vrabel's in. Mike Vrabel had uh -huh. the privilege of playing the Jaguars twice. He had the luxury of playing the Houston Texans twice, and he had the honor of playing the Indianapolis Colts twice. Meanwhile, Mike Tomlin had the unfortunate issue of having to play Joe Burrow and that streaking hot Bengals yeah, team. That came Mike Tomlin, unfortunately, had to play the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson when Lamar Jackson was present, and then he did have the honor of playing Baker Mayfield. I'm about to say, <laughs> and then you made it all better with that dessert, that injured dessert called Baker. Bake them up. Coming up, the Packers are the number one seed in the NFC, but we'll tell you if they're actually the best team in the conference. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Get them Baker buns, boy. They go down. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers and the Packers enter the playoffs with a first-round bye as the number one seed in the NFC. Now, head coach Matt LaFleur has led Green Bay to three straight seasons of 13 wins. Something Mike McCarthy only did twice, Marcel. Chill, yeah. chill, champ, Now, champ, the Packers champ. are favorites to make it to the Super Bowl, according to Fox Best Sportsbook. So, Sel, are the Packers clearly the best team in the NFC? No, they're not clearly the best team in the NFC, and they know this as well. If we were able to hypnotize them, especially their leader, Aaron Rodgers, all the therapy he's been going through and letting us in on that same group therapy, he would know that there's still a moment that he must conquer, that they must conquer. One, actually having that number one seed, having home field advantage, and taking full advantage of home field advantage. Did that happen last year? Oh, that leads me to my point. Leads me to the team. Tampa Bay Buccaneers are still right there. You know that this year, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers set a franchise record for the most wins? That's talking about a franchise that just won the Super Bowl. They won more this year than they did last year. And they had more games to do it. But the point is, this team is right where they want to be. Just not how they designed it, but exactly in the race as they were last year. Now, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Green Bay Packers, go back to Lambeau. Who has the advantage there mentally? Two scoreboards we always talk about in points, and we always talk about psychologically. Psychologically, I'm still going with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. In terms of points, all of a sudden, I start looking at the best offense, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, best passing offense, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, more points per game than any other team in the league, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. If they're two scoreboards and one is points and one is psychological and they're both in Tampa Bay's favor, 
Tampa Bay, best team in the NFC. See, I, I think that the Packers are absolutely the best team in the NFC, but what we're talking about is who's going to play better when it matters most. Oh, okay. Like Good last point. year, the Packers had proven that they were the best team in the NFC up until the NFC Championship game when all of a sudden they did not play better. But Aaron Rodgers is on any given Sunday or every given Sunday, the best quarterback yes. on the field. Yes. While Tom Brady should win the MVP based on the aggregate number, the only time efficiency matters is actually within the course of one football game. Because now we ain't talking about aggregate All numbers. Them, yeah. Now we're talking about this one. This. Aaron Rodgers is better in his one games. Um, Aaron Rodgers has that ability at home, 22-2 and two at home with Matt LaFleur. Hasn't lost back-to-back games under Matt LaFleur. 13 consecu- three consecutive 13-win seasons hmm. with Matt LaFleur. And now you have playmakers on defense and Bakhtiari's back at left tackle. Jair Alexander's supposed to be back all-pro cornerback. I think the Packers are absolutely the best team in the NFC. Packers just got to put it together. You mm. know and you always remind me of just how much Aaron Rodgers fails in those big moments. I believe he's lost his last four NFC championship games, if one I am not four. mistaken. One and four. So <clears throat> Aaron Rodgers has the talent, the team has the ability, but will they execute on that day? That's what it comes down to. Yeah, and you always remind me that it's about the coach-quarterback combo. You tell – I was watching on YouTube. I watch our YouTube a lot. I actually comment. I got a, like a Kevin Durant account. Nobody knows it's me yet. I'll tell y'all what it is one day. I'll be, boy, I am the best analyst to me. I'll tell you that. I'll be writing stuff. But I was listening to you yesterday. You said, oh, you show me a team that has a great quarterback and coach, coach combo, combo yes, and you'll show me a Super Bowl champion, yes, right? Sir. And then I started to assess that and talk about Tom Brady and Bruce Arians versus Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur in a Super Bowl conversation. Tom Brady would loan everybody rings and still have some left over, right? That combination of him and Bruce Arians, that's eight total rings, right? Uh, One for Aaron Rodgers, zero for Matt LaFleur. He has nothing to even contribute. It's just in those magical moments when you get to the moment that matters the most. I'm still scared for this Packers team. Are they going to put it all together? And that's what I see out of Tampa Bay. And being real, everything that Tampa Bay went through this year, it's so funny. On paper, they returned the entire roster from their Super Bowl championship. And then they ripped up the piece of paper because the team Golly. was this man, mass unit, et cetera. I don't know. It's going to be a clash of the Titans when those two teams get together. Coming up, the Rams ended the regular season with a tough loss. I'll tell you if Sean McVay is keeping it 100 with his reaction or just 99. That's next on Speak for Yourself. On this show, we only know how to keep it 100, but others... Y'all out there, y'all keep it 99. So each day, we're going to get to the bottom of who's really telling the truth. Case in point, the Rams lost a close one to the 49ers Sunday. But Sean McVay still has a positive attitude heading to the playoffs. Listen. You can always draw on previous experiences. Going into the playoffs, winning or losing, really hasn't been much of a factor um, on how teams do, depending upon whichever lens you want to look at it through. So we're going to choose to say it doesn't mean <laughs> I love it. Sean McVay keeping it 100 or 99? Uh, he's keeping it 100, big dog. I-, I think he's keeping it 100 because that game is over. It means absolutely nothing. The Rams have got the Cardinals up on deck. They know what it is. They beat the Cardinals once. They've lost to the Cardinals once. Yeah. There's absolutely zero point to reflect on that loss to the Niners. Now, what you can do rather than reflecting on it is learn from it. Mm-hmm. And I think Sean McVay will absolutely learn from it. If they go up 17-0 against the Cardinals, they will approach the game differently than when they went up 17-0 against the Niners. Mm. He'll learn from that, but he's not reflecting on that. That game does mean absolutely nothing. It's playoff time, boy. It's 0-0. Yeah, I'm with him. It's facts and fiction. Think about it. The fact is, you don't have to win the last game to win a Super Bowl. Remember the Giants when they lost to the Patriots? Perfect Patriots came back and beat them. But it also is a fiction. It does mean something. You're looking at Matthew Stafford like, dog, you ever throw another interception when it matters <laughs> most, I'm going to have a problem with you. But everyone out there, before we go, congrats to our very own Gabe and his wife, Jess, on the birth of their son, Noah Bradley Jefferson. Much love. Let's see who he look like. Oh, we got to put a picture of the <laughs> That's about a six-pounder right there. Look at me. I got too many kids. I told you, look at this. This is something you should aspire to. All them Emmys you want to wear. And won't you just take Dang. love in, Acho? Congrats to my dog, Congrats. Gabe, man. That is amazing right there. I want to see some more. Oh, man. Well, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Take care of yourselves. Take care of the little one. Take care of the family. That's it for us. We'll see you tomorrow. And we're now. <laughs> I'm such a good friend.